while back I was asked to speak at a meditation group where most of the people didn't consider themselves Buddhist. They just liked the meditation, liked to practice mindfulness. And they asked me to explain how necessary it was to read other teachings and the canon, to augment the meditation. And it struck me the, the main issue was understanding what mindfulness is. If you see it simply as something that's a matter of accepting, accepting, accepting whatever comes up, being non-reactive, being non-judgmental, then the Buddha wouldn't have had to say very much, just accept more, accept more thoroughly. But that's not what mindfulness is. It means keeping something in mind. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is the extent to which you are shaping your experience. And so you want to shape it well by the attitudes you bring and your ideas of what you actually can do to shape your experience. And this is where reading is useful. It suggests possibilities you might not have thought of otherwise. And it gives you some good points. One is to notice that when the Buddha teaches mindfulness, i.e. this ability to keep something in mind. He gives you some frames of reference and he gives you some recommendations as to the qualities you want to bring. The frames of reference are the body in and of itself, like we're doing right now, focusing on the breath. Feelings in and of themselves, i.e. feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Mind states in and of themselves. Noticing, say, the whether the mind is overcome by passion or it's free of passion, overcome by aversion or free of aversion, delusion. And then in noticing as you get into the meditation ever more refined distinctions in the mind. And then mental qualities, specific qualities that come up in the mind. If you think of the mind as a committee, mind states are like the whole committee agreeing on something, and mental qualities are the different members, which sometimes are with you and sometimes are against you, if you want to meditate. Again, you look at these things in and of themselves as events happening. That's your frame of reference. The in and of themselves is important, because it's very easy when you think of a feeling, say, to associate all the things that would give rise to pleasure with a particular feeling, and then the mind slips off in that direction. If there's a feeling of pain, it's going to run and try to find something that will give it pleasure, instead of looking at the pain in and of itself as an event, as something that comes and goes, and around which a lot of mental qualities can come. Because these various frames of reference are all right here together. It's very easy to move from one to the next, or away from them entirely. But when you've got them here together is when you're focusing on the breath. You have the feelings that are associated with the breath, the mind states that help you stay here, the mental qualities that are either getting in the way or helping you. They're all right here. And if you move from them one set to another consciously, it's perfectly okay. So you want to be able to keep these things in mind and not slip off to another frame of reference. Like that science fiction story I read years ago, where there was a spacecraft that didn't have to use fuel because it moved simply by changing its frame of reference. If its frame of reference was the Earth, it would stay with the Earth, wouldn't move. Its frame of reference was the sun, it would move away from the Earth at the same speed that the Earth is moving around the sun, going in the opposite direction. If its frame of reference was the center of the galaxy, it would be way out there. And the mind is like that. It shifts its frame of reference very quickly. 
you can very quickly find yourself in a totally foreign space from where you thought you were. So you want to be able to keep this frame of reference in mind. Keep reminding yourself, for instance, you're going to stay with the breath. You're going to look at everything in the body in terms of the breath. The levels of breath energy you can, you can sense. Getting into the details. We're getting a large sense of the background energy in the body. Learning how to stay balanced right there. Those are some of the things you keep in mind. And then you want to bring two other qualities besides the mindfulness. One of them is alertness, watching what you're doing. Checking on the mind, checking on the body, i.e. checking on your object and also checking on the state of the mind to see whether it's going to stay here or not, and being quick to notice when it's beginning to slip off. And then the third quality is ardency. And this is where things get complex. Because ardency means basically right effort. And right effort involves a lot of things. There can be the effort to comprehend something. There can be the effort to abandon something. There can be the effort to develop. If you know the mind has unskillful tendencies and you're going to a situation where the, your buttons tend to get pushed, well, prepare. You want to prevent those unskillful tendencies from coming up or from taking over. You know they would probably come up when the button gets pushed, but you don't have to let them out in your words or your actions. You don't want the thoughts to take over the mind. There are some things to tolerate, other things that you don't want to tolerate. You have to learn how to tolerate painful sensations when you can't avoid them. Painful words that other people speak, because after all, it is their right to use their mouths. But you don't want to tolerate unskillful qualities that are going to threaten to take over the mind. So you have to learn how to make these distinctions, figure out what needs to be done right now. And this is where it's useful to read what the Buddha has to say about how you might comprehend suffering, say, or how you might abandon its cause. Look at the way he defines suffering so you can get a sense of what in your life really is suffering. Because sometimes there are things that he classes as suffering that we actually like, we go for. Some things that he classifies as the path to the end of suffering that go against the grain. And so it's useful not only to know what these things are, but also to learn useful strategies for getting yourself to follow what's skillful and to abandon what's not, inspiring yourself, motivating yourself. That's when it's useful to read what he has to say, and then to keep it in mind. That's another function of mindfulness. It's not just keeping the body in mind, but remembering things are going to come up, and you yourself are in the process of shaping a lot of this stuff to begin with. So what can you do to shape it skillfully? Because one of the things you really do have to accept is the extent to which you are responsible for the amount of suffering you're undergoing. And other people may be doing horrible things, but the question of whether you're going to suffer from that or not, that's your responsibility. And learning how not to suffer requires a lot of skill. So when you find yourself running out of strategies, it's useful to look and see what the Buddha had to say what the Ajahns had to say. You find as you practice that you go through rhythms. There'll be times when you're exploring inside, developing the skill, and you don't want the books to get in the way. Other times when you run out of what you know and you need to 
get some more inspiration or to widen your sense of what the possibilities are. Then you go back to read some more. But everything ultimately gets tested right here as you're trying to stay with the breath and deal skillful, skillfully with the breath itself and with everything else that comes up, whether it's in terms of the body or your feelings or mind states or individual mental qualities. There's a lot to be done here. And they're all good things. As the Buddha said, there are three factors of the path that specifically work together. There's right view as to what's skillful and what's not. Right mindfulness helps you remember that you want to abandon what's unskillful and develop what's skillful. And that's the actual effort. Notice the effort here is not so much physical effort requiring that you drive and drive and drive yourself into the ground. That's not what the Buddha is talking about. It's the effort to watch what the mind is doing and what needs to be done about what the mind is doing. It's an internal effort. So these three qualities, right view, right mindfulness, right effort, they circle around every factor of the path. And so where do we get our right views? We get some of them from listening, reading, and we get some of them from just watching, looking at what we're doing right now and seeing where it's causing stress, and trying to detect when that stress is unnecessary. The Buddha said there, two ways that awakening comes. One is through listening to the voice of another person, teaching the Dharma. And the other is through your own appropriate attention, i.e. looking at your actions and figuring out what's working and what's not. But even if the inspiration comes from the voice of another, the voice of another can't do the work for you. You take what you learn and you apply it. Accepting the fact, and this is where the acceptance is really important, that you are shaping things, so you might as well learn how to shape them well. The path is something you fabricate, you put it together. And so try to develop an artisan sense of pride in your work. That's what you want to keep in mind.